Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's live broadcast, Expansion of Human Stem Cells in BioBlue Single-Use Vessels from Eppendorf. I am Judy O'Rourke of LabRoots, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. Today's webcast is presented by LabRoots.com, the leading social media site for science professionals, and sponsored by Eppendorf. Eppendorf is a leading life science company that develops and sells instruments, consumables, and services for liquid, sample, and cell handling in laboratories worldwide. For more information, please visit eppendorf.com. Before we start, there are a few instructions. This webinar has been approved for continuing educational credits. Please click on the CE button at the bottom left corner and follow the process to receive your credits. We want to hear from you during this interactive broadcast, so please ask questions or leave us a comment. Answers are welcome, too. You can do this by hitting the green Q&A button at the lower left of the presentation window and typing in your comments and questions. We'll try to get to as many as we can, and we'll follow up if we don't have time today. Want a better look? You can enlarge the slide window by clicking on the screen icon in the lower right-hand corner of the slide window. If you can't hear or see this presentation properly, let us know by clicking on the support button on the top right or use the Q&A button. We'll make sure we try to resolve any issues. Now let's get right to today's presenter. We are proud to welcome Stacy Willard, PhD, a Senior Technical Application Specialist in Bioprocess at Eppendorf. Dr. Willard earned a PhD from the University of Virginia and has more than 15 years experience in cell culture applications in both academia and industry. After completing postdoctoral work at Johns Hopkins Medical School, she spent time at a startup drug discovery company and at a large cancer institute before joining Eppendorf. As part of the Global Bioprocess Applications team at Eppendorf, Dr. Willard specializes in high-level problem solving for customers, training, and product development. I will now hand the presentation over to Dr. Willard. Thank you very much for that excellent introduction. I'm happy to be here today and for the opportunity to share with you an update on what Eppendorf has been doing with um, the expansion of stem cells and single-use bioreactors. The title of my talk today is Expansion of Human Stem Cells in Eppendorf BioBlue Single-Use Vessels, and it's a true collaboration between a couple of our applications laboratories at Eppendorf. Uh, you'll notice in the byline here, uh, there's a laboratory here in Connecticut, in Enfield, Connecticut, in the United States. We also have a laboratory in Belgium, uh, and we have another very close collaborator at Hanover Medical School, and the data I'm going to present today is attributed to you all three of these laboratories. So today we're going to talk a little bit about stem cells in general, human stem cells in particular, the different types, where they come from, and what they're used for in uh, the clinical application. We'll tell you a little bit about what we've done and how we've done it, talk about our results and some conclusions and future work that can be done in this area, and uh, let's get started, let's jump right into it. So human stem cells. This will be a bit of a review for some of you, but some of you might be new to the stem cell field, so I wanted to take a moment to make sure we're all on the same page with some definitions. Stem cells are cells that are capable of self-renewal and daughter cell generation for long periods. And you can see in the little diagram on the slide here that a stem cell will divide creating a daughter cell that can differentiate or specialize into a cell type, a different cell type, and then it will also create another one of itself, and that's the self-renewal process. It maintains its ability to uh, divide over and over again for a long period of time. The stem cell itself is undifferentiated, which means it's unspecialized, so it doesn't have a lot of those uh, characteristics that we attribute to things like a neuron or a liver cell or something like that. They are generally non-specialized cells. But they can give rise to specialized cell types. And sometimes that means that there's a middleman, so their daughter cell can be uh, something like a transit amplifying cell or a uh, middle stem cell type that can still give rise to other cell types, etc. So to be classified as a stem cell, um, you can break them down into three different categories. Totipotent, which is a stem cell that can give rise to any cell type, including part of the, um, part of the placenta and other embryonic tissues. Pluripotent, 
which is one that can give rise to many cell types, all of the different germ layers of the embryo, in fact, and multipotent, which can give rise to several cell types, with, but not usually all different cell types in the embryo. So stem cells can be classified in those three ways, and you'll hear me use these different potency terms throughout the presentation. So I wanted to make sure we were all on the same page in terms of what those words meant. Moving on. So stem cells for research purposes can be broadly characterized into three types, and this is all to do with where they come from. So as you can imagine, embryonic stem cells are pluripotent, so they can give rise to any of the tissue types in the embryo. Adult stem cells coming from adult tissues are usually multipotent, so they cannot give rise to every single cell type in the embryo, but they can become multiple cell types if they're induced to differentiate or specialize. And then third, induced pluripotent stem cells are actually somatic or regular adult body cells that are reprogrammed to become pluripotent or have the potential to become any embryonic cell type. Um, so in this presentation today, we're not going to talk about embryonic stem cells. We're going to focus in on the adult stem cell population and the induced pluripotent stem cell population. And we've been doing a lot of work at Eppendorf in terms of trying to create large numbers of these cells for research purposes, and so that's what we'll focus on today. So one of these adult stem cell types are human mesenchymal stem cells, or HMSCs. MSCs are adult stem cells of stromal origin, so they come from connective tissues of cells of any organ. Examples are the uterine mucosa, the prostate stroma, the bone marrow, adipose tissues, ovary. Um, many different cell types have been used to derive mesenchymal stem cells, and the different types of stem cells can then be induced to differentiate into other cell types, and the number of types of cells they can become is determined by their tissue of origin. So these stem cells, MSCs in particular, are involved in a large number of clinical trials. In fact, there's several that are already in phase three stage, and there are actually already drugs, in quotes, on the market because they are actually cellular therapy um, products. They're being manufactured in Korea. They're being used for treatment in the field already. So this is a, a field that has great hope and great promise for um, disease treatment. You can see here, if you just go to clinicaltrials.gov, that there's over 600 trials in the USA alone involving mesenchymal stem cells, and that's just in the U.S. You can imagine if you total up everything globally that there are probably thousands of clinical trials going on right now involving these stem cells. So in, since maybe the year 2000, this field has just exploded in terms of uh, interest. So what can mesenchymal stem cells become, and what is their potential for disease treatment? If you look at this diagram here, you can see the mesenchymal stem cell in the middle, and you can see all the different types of cells that, that have been uh, a subset of what's been done so far. So they can be used to generate myocytes or muscle tissue, skin cells, fibroblasts, um, central nervous system neurons like astrocytes and other cell types. Um, stromal cells from the bone marrow, fat cells or adipocytes, um, cells that make up tendons and ligaments, different specialized fibroblasts, and then, of course, osteocytes in bone. So many, many different cell types have already been derived from these adult stem cells, the MSCs. And I'm sure you could imagine that the potential clinical application of these cells is, is quite huge and varied. Um, here's a, a nice diagram showing you some of the potential uh, disease treatments for things like baldness, blindness, deafness, um, ALS, myocardial infarction, muscular dystrophy. I won't mention all of them, but you can see them here. And so the, the, the hopes on this, on this uh, whole field in general are, are quite high. So the other type of stem cell we're going to focus on today is the human-induced pluripotent stem cell. Again, can be, uh, can be used for cellular therapy and disease modeling, but their origin is quite different than the mesenchymal stem cell population. So the HIPSCs are actually reprogrammed from adult samples. These can be things like a biopsy or a blood sample, 
and then they can be, uh, after they're reprogrammed for pluripotency, they can be differentiated into multiple cell types. So if you look at this diagram here, what you can see is we have this human in the middle here, a healthy or a diseased individual, and then a, a sample is taken from that individual by, via biopsy, via blood sample, et cetera, and the somatic cells are grown from that sample. So this can be done, as you can imagine, autologously. So a sample from the affected patient can be taken, somatic cells can be grown from that patient sample, and then using any of these techniques that are outlined up above here, um, you can see that we can force expression of genes that will induce pluripotent nature in these cells. So things like using a virus to express protein, using a plasmid to force expression of a protein, protein transduction itself, miRNA, small molecules, all of these things have been shown to be used in reprogramming the cells to become pluripotent, whereas they weren't before. So in the dish here, what you end up with is a human-induced pluripotent cell line here in the, in the Petri dish here. And then, of course, using these cells, you can then initiate differentiation into cell types uh, that you find in the embryo, ectoderm, mesoderm, and endoderm. And many, many cell types have been catalyzed so far as possible and potential um, from the IPSC population. So a little bit about the field of IPSC. Uh, IPSC reprogramming has been something that's come up uh, pretty recently in the stem cell field. The seminal work being a publication by the Yamanaka group where human foreskin fibroblasts were forced to overexpress a list of factors called the Yamanaka factors. And those included OX34, SOX2, KLF4, and CMYC. And expression of this combination of factors imparted pluripotency to these normal just everyday fibroblasts. Uh, and that was a pretty seminal finding. And then selection of those reprogrammed clones resulted in populations that can express other pluripotency markers, such as FSEA4, TRA160, and there's quite a few others, but I'm, I'm, of course, purposely calling out these because we're going to talk about them later in the presentation. So the reprogrammed cells can then be induced to differentiate into other specialized cell types. So once you express the Yamanaka factors, you show that the cells are pluripotent, you can then, by di a different combination of treatment, of media, et cetera, you can get them to differentiate into specialized cell types, such as cardiomyocytes. Some of you might have tuned into uh, another recent stem cell webinar by Ebendorf, where our close colleague at Rutgers, Rick Cohen, took some uh, reprogrammed IPSC cell lines and made cardiomyocytes from them, made dopamine neurons from them, and so we've shown that in quite a few different ways that you can get many different specialized cell types from these reprogrammed cells. And so I'm sure you can imagine the potential of, of a dish of cardiomyocytes, dopamine neurons, insulin-producing cells, and these cells will then express factors that relate to their identity, such as a cardiomyocyte will, will express a cardiomyocyte-specific marker and you can use that to follow their repro reprogrammability or differentiation ability. So uh, uh, that was by way of an introduction to the field and what's been going on there. And the stage that we're at now in the field is that producing a critical mass of stem cells has been very challenging. Uh, for example, spontaneous differentiation is a problem in the culture aggregation of the cells. Um, some cell lines like aggregation, some cell lines don't, and we have had a few that have had detrimental effects because of that aggregation. Uh, pH and oxygen sensitivity. Uh, we have to be very careful about what the pH is in the culture and the sensitivity of the cells to uh, DO or dissolved oxygen. And, it, and then also they're very sensitive to shear forces. So they, uh, if we stir too fast or, or sparge in too many bubbles into the culture, sometimes that can cause detrimental effects such as differentiation and loss of, of cell growth. So the final expanded population of stem cells, the MSC and IPSC, should have the following characteristics. And this is going to be a very important uh, point that we're going to come and refer back to throughout the whole rest of the presentation. So take a minute to make sure that we're all clear on this. So the large cell numbers 
is the first thing we're after here. As I'm sure you can imagine, if you're going to do autologous cellular therapy, you need a very large number of cells to be able to differentiate into enough cells to treat a patient with. The cells must retain their pluri or multipotency. So they must be able to continue on and retain the markers that make them stem cells. Um, as opposed to all differentiating into daughter cells and going off down the, the line of differentiation. And then third, the cell must retain the ability to differentiate into the desired cell type. So even if you have a multipotent cell line that has large cell numbers, if it can't become the cell that you want it to become, then that becomes not, not what we're looking for. So the, the three characteristics that I've outlined here, we're going to keep coming back to because I'm going to show you in the rest of the, the presentation and the rest of the work that we have actually accomplished these three goals for multiple different cell types in multiple scales. So here I'm showing you uh, a summary or an illustration of what I'm about to tell you in the rest of the presentation. So to illustrate the process of scaling up cell culture in BioBlue single-use vessels, we use two different MSC cell lines and some HIPSC cell lines in BioBlue single-use vessels using both the DOS box and the New Brunswick Celligen Blue bioprocess control stations. So what you can see on the top here is at the small scale, we've used cultivation of MSCs on microcarriers at the, the 250 mil volume, so that's this one up here. You can see this bioreactor is, is much smaller, and we can show that we generate large cell numbers, we retain stem cell markers, and we can still differentiate into specialized cell types. And then similarly, we can scale up to the BioBlue 5C, which is a maximum working volume of 3.75 liters. And then in this case also, we can get large cell numbers, in fact, up to a billion stem cells in one batch, stem cell markers, and are retained and cells are still able to differentiate into multiple cell types. So we've done quite a bit of work on MSCs in the past, and if you're interested in the detail, I, won't, I can't go into the detail on every single bioreactor and all of the set points in this presentation, or I would run out of time quite quickly, but if you'd like to, you can look at our, pub, our publications that are all available and linked uh, here on the, on the forum somewhere. And then we'll switch gears and we'll talk about the cultivation of induced pluripotent stem cells. So at the, we've done quite a bit of work with our collaborators at, and at the Hanover Medical School and also in our lab here at Enfield with IPSC at the small scale. So we're talking about the small BioBlue 3.3C bioreactor or the mini bioreactor at a maximum working volume of 250 milliliters. And again, we can show that we get expansion of cell numbers we retain cell markers, and we are still able to differentiate into different cell types. So that's a high-level summary of what we're going to talk about for the rest of the presentation. And as soon as I load up here, we are ready to move on to the materials and methods. So as I said, I won't go over every single tiny detail about every bioreactor because it would take me hours, but I will talk generally about the control stations. So in the small-scale work, we use the DOS box mini bioreactor system. And the uh, greatest feature about this system is that it is a truly parallel process development vehicle. It allows DOE capability. It has up, you can run up to 24 of these 0.3-liter vessels simultaneously and in a truly parallel uh, manner. So it has a very powerful platform. And then when you get to the larger scale, the bench scale, something like the 5-liter stirred tank, you can move on to many of our controllers, which are compatible with the BioBlue single-use vessel, including what we used for our study, which was the Celogen Blue Benchtop Bioreactor. We can combine the single-use technology of the BioBlue vessel with the already tried and true performance of the traditional stirred tank design, making that quite a powerful combination as well. So the vessels, uh, the vessels, the BioBlue single-use vessel line are available all the way from the 300 milliliter scale all the way up to the 50 liter scale, making it uh, uh, quite a perfect scale up for stem cell work. Um, they are rigid walled stirred tank bioreactors. Um, they have a pitch blade impeller. 
They are USP class six and animal component free, so they're appropriate for GMP production. And of course, they're proven scalability, so you can scale up from uh, all the way from the 0.3 all the way up to the 50C. Also, I should mention uh, that at the one liter scale and greater, they are compatible with multiple of our control stations, so that's a really nice feature as well. I get a lot of questions in, when I talk about the BioBlue single-use vessels about leachables. And uh, there's a lot of data that, that, that we have on the plastics, but we can also show you these data, which is where we've done an extraction on the plastic in the vessel itself at 37 degrees for three days, and then we've grown CHO cells in that extracted media to show that, in fact, there's no uh, effect, detrimental effect on growth of the cells. Um, due to anything coming out of the, the plastic into the medium at 37 degrees. So you can see here in this graph, what we're showing is um, many of the different sizes of vessels were tested. And so the media was left in the vessel at 37 degrees for three days, and then show cells were inoculated into that media, and we saw no detrimental effect, as you can see all the way out here, on growth based on this, uh, this extracted media. So uh, this is just a, we're going to show you a little summary of the different cell lines and medium that we used in the studies. Um, if you're working on stem cells right now, then you're very familiar with the fact that every single one of these cell lines is a bit different. They all have their own personality based on where they came from, and they were, are all uh, needing optimization in the particular laboratory. So. At any time, you probably are not going to be able to just order one of these cell lines and immediately get it to grow. There will definitely be a little bit of a learning curve with stem cells, and I'm sure all of the stem cell biologists in the audience are nodding their heads going, yep, yep, we always have to take a lot of optimization on these cell lines. So for our adipose-derived stem cell work, we, retain, we, we took our stem cell source as ATCC. We used ATCC's medium kit for growing those cells. As for their growth support or type, both MSC cell lines require microcarrier. So uh, in fact, for the uh, adipose-derived mesenchymal stem cell work, we got our microcarrier from Paul Corporation, and some were collagen-coated and some were not. You'll see we got better results using collagen-coated microcarrier. And then for the bone marrow uh, MSC work, you can see that we got our stem cell from Lanza. We used the Lanza bullet kit for medium. And similar to the other MSC cell line, they are anchorage dependent, and so they grow on microcarrier, and we grew them on GE Healthcare Cytodex uh, microcarrier. And then for the IPSC work, the work that we did involved a cell line that was derived at the uh, medical center in Hanover, and then there was an, another cell line that we got here in the US from the ATCC. Um, both work involves stem cell technology's teaser line of media, either M-teaser or teaser E8, and they were grown either in free aggregates without microcarrier, or we also did some work using microcarrier. And the microcarrier that we used for that work was Paul Corporation's collagen-coated microcarrier. I'll tell you a little bit more in uh, subsequent slides what I mean by growing in aggregates, but the difference between uh, an MSC cell line usually and an IPSC cell line is that the IPSC cells tend to like to form clumps. They like to be in aggregates, and you can actually get them to grow in very large cell numbers by maintaining that aggregation on purpose. So we'll talk more about that later. And again, as I said, all the set points, inoculation densities, all of that information that you're looking for can be found in the related publications that you can see linked under the links section and you can also ask us for them. We're happy to send you out some links via email as well if you reach out to us. So let's get into the results. First, let's talk about the MSC cell. So for the adipose-derived MSCs, or the ad MSCs, there was a, a, a very interesting finding on inoculum preparation, actually. When we first started to grow the cells, we saw that the field had classically grown them in spinner flasks in a standard CO2 incubator but we weren't getting great results using that format. So we decided to switch over and grow them in uh, single-use Erlenmeyer shake flasks on a, on a shaking CO2 incubator. You can find this work previously published in the Bioprocessing Journal, and basically we've developed a novel method using shake flasks instead of spinner flasks. 
using the New Brunswick S41i CO2 incubator shaker. And the reason why this is my favorite of the incubator line is that it has, can go very low speed shaking, so you don't have a shear force problem in your culture. You don't really need to use clamps if you don't so desire. You can use the proprietary sticky pad that we have available. Um, and also you can put a static shelf in this incubator as well. So you can go all the way from your tea flask into your shake flask and start your scale up all in the same incubator. So that's a pretty powerful uh, platform there. You can go all the way up to a maximum of two liter volume using 10 one liter shake flasks. And of course the advantage is that you don't have to put a magnetic stir plate inside the incubator and generate extra heat that the incubator has to then deal with and when it's trying to do temperature control. And of course, logistically, it's very simple and large capacity to just use a shaker platform. So it ended up being a very useful novel method for making the inoculum. And just to show you a little bit of data on why we think the shake flask method is a little bit better for this particular cell line, if you look at this uh, graph here, what you can see is that in the shake flask in blue, we got a much higher total cell number over time than we did with the spinner. And we wanted to know why that was, so if you do a little further investigation, what you can see is the concentration of glucose and ammonia are uh, correlating with that increased growth. So you see here the concentration of glucose in the spinner flask is going down much slower than it is in the shake flask, which, is, which correlates with the faster growth rate that we got in the shake flask. And then, of course, the concentration of ammonia built up faster in the spinner flask. And ammonia is known to be toxic, especially to a sensitive cell line like a stem cell line. So this was sort of uh, not unexpected, but a good, um, a good uh, way to, to show that this method was definitely the way to go. So once we got enough inoculum to go into the bioreactor at the larger scale, uh, we went ahead uh, to inoculate a BioBlue 5C single-use vessel using collagen-coated microcarrier beads. And this was actually done using only overlay DO control at a low DO set point. So this was uh, trying to mimic a hypoxic condition. And our cell density reached 4 times 10 to the fifth cells per milliliter, which actually ended up being 1.5 billion cells in one single batch run. So this was actually quite a successful experiment. And our glucose and lactate concentrations over time matched what you would expect from this method. So glucose went down over time. What you can see from the second graph here is that every time glucose is peaking, that's happening because we're changing media. So every couple of days, we would let the microcarrier settle, remove some of the spent media, added fresh media, and this allowed us to do great pH control and allowed us to really provide the nutrients that these cells needed to reach such high density. So uh, we can show now the data from doing this in uh, 0.3C and 5C scale. In both scales, large cell numbers were achieved. So if you are interested in starting at the, the small stage before you scale up to the 5C, the 0.3C is very successful in growing uh, mesenchymal stem cells as well. If you compare the two methods here in this slide, you can see that we reach very similar densities using the 0.3C single-use vessel as we did with the 5C single-use vessel. And we're also showing you here that we can have this similar excellent growth profile in adipose-derived stem cells and bone marrow-derived stem cells. So this is not just a one cell line in particular method. This works for multiple cell lines at multiple scales, which is a really nice, robust method. So the first uh, order of business was to make a lot of cells. And we've shown you that we can do that using the BioBlue single-use vessel. But making a lot of cells is really only valuable if they are still stem cells. So what we can show here is that we're satisfying that second of the, of the rules that I presented to you in the beginning. Cells are retaining their multipotency marker expression. And the markers that we've chosen to identify here with the ADMSC line are CD44 in green. And the best way to be able to see this is to look at the microcarrier bridging here. So this is actually cells between the, the microcarrier. So let me just circle it here so it's nice and clear for you. 
right here, you can see the cell bridging across two very large microcarriers, and you can see that they are green, expressing the CD44 uh, stem cell marker. And then if you look in the next panel, you can see again on one of the microcarrier bridges here, you can see the red expression of CD90. So you can see that after expansion in the BioBlue 5C, they are still retaining their, uh, their stem cell markers. Just in case that wasn't uh, quantitative or clear enough for you, we also went ahead and uh, confirmed these results by PCR analysis. And so here we're looking at markers similar to what I mentioned in the beginning of the presentation. So we have OX34. We've got SOX2 expression. We have beta actin as our control. We have CD105. We have CD44. And then as our negative control, we have CD45. And so what you can see from these graphs are these um, gel pictures is that in lane one, we have a positive control. So you should see a positive in each one of lane one. Lane two is our negative control, so you shouldn't see anything in lane two. And then three, four, five, and six are samples taken at various times throughout the bioreactor run. And you can see that they are retaining the expression of the multipotency markers like they are supposed to. So uh, they are getting large cell numbers. They are retaining their pluripotent markers, their multipotency markers. And now we need to know whether they are still able to differentiate into the specialized cell type that we're interested in. So we're going to show two examples here. The first is the uh, bone marrow-derived stem cells cultivated in the BioBlue 0.3C single-use vessel, and we're showing you that we've successfully differentiated those cells into osteogenic lineage, uh, which you can see on the right side of this slide here is Elizarin Red S staining. So that shows you calcium deposition, and calcium deposition is, of course, a marker for osteogenic lineage. And then you can see uh, this quantitation using the osteoimage mineralization assay, showing that the non-induced versus induced is a huge difference. So over time, you get more and more differentiation into this osteogenic lineage. Moving on to the, the adipose-derived mesenchymal stem cells, we've differentiated these cells from the BioBlue 5C into adip adipocytes and osteocytes. Adipocytes being uh, ones that will create lip lipid droplets, which is what you can see in panel A here by the red oil O, oil red O staining. And then in panel B, you can also see the alizarin red S staining, which is indicative of calcium mineralization or osteocyte, osteogenic lineage. So in fact, these cells are able to differentiate into specific cell types that we are asking them to differentiate into. So what about the IPSC? the induced pluripotent stem cells. And these are a very different cell line to handle. <clears throat> I want to show you a little bit more about that aggregate formation technique that I mentioned in the beginning of the presentation. So uh, iPSCs can be grown either on microcarrier or in aggregates. And we're actually developing both applications at Eppendorf. I'm going to spend most of my time talking to you about the data that was kindly provided by our collaborator at uh, in Hanover Medical School. Um, Four-fold expansion in his lab was achieved of HIPSCs as aggregates in a stirred tank batch format. And you'll notice I have this word batch in quotes. I'll tell you why that is in a minute in a, in a future slide. Um, IPSC is incredibly sensitive to uh, pH and to DO and to shear and to these other types of issues. And the batch, in quotes, is indicating the fact that daily we allow the aggregates to settle and replenish the media with fresh media to make sure that everything is exactly the way the cell lines require. So what you can see in this picture here is you can see that in the beginning, when we first start on day zero, the cells are single cells. And you can uh, go ahead and zoom in on this if you'd like on your screen or uh, look at it later. And you can maybe blow it up and see the single cells there. And then they start to form aggregates as time goes on. And those aggregates get larger and larger until you have, on day seven, a field full of very large spheres here. And they can get quite large. They can get over 300 microns in diameter. Um, 
in our lab we jokingly refer to them as meatballs at that stage because they just look so humongous in the, in the microscope. And of course, as the aggregate gets larger, the inside of the aggregate starts to have issues like differentiation, restriction of nutrients, and, and they start to be less healthy. So there is a upper limit to what you want to get, let those aggregates get to be in terms of size. So what the group in, in Hanover has done quite successfully is shown that in the BioBlue point three C stage, you can get expansion of IPSC as aggregates in this "quote unquote" batch format, um, and so we're, it's not uh, it's a bit a bit more like halfway between a batch and a fed batch at this point. So we are feeding the cells, we are replenishing some of the media, uh, but it's it's not quite at something that you would call a perfusion because it's being done in a bolus way once a day. Um, and you can check out these graphs here. These show you the, all the different types of uh, metabolic profile that we have. And you can see the cells grow quite nicely. Um, glucose concentration goes up each time the media is replenished. Um, and then pH, of course, changes every time the media is changed as well. Interestingly, this group has also developed a quote unquote perfusion method as well. And so what this means is that they're using the, the delicate control on the DOS box system to be able to actually stop agitation on a schedule every two hours for 10 minutes and then remove a small amount of media and replenish it with, with fresh media. And this is something that's, that's enabled by the fact that IPSC grow in these larger aggregates. So of course when you turn off agitation, the aggregates will settle quite quickly because they're quite heavy, and then you can easily take off some, med some media and put in some fresh media. And by doing this slowly over the course of the entire day, we get the same result as a nice perfusion without having to use a cell retention device or uh, that have that extra capital investment. And we get even better growth of the cells in this format. So you can see in the graph here, if I just point out here, that in this graph you can see that the red and the black bars show you the difference between the, the batch slash fed batch that I showed you in the past slide and then this perfusion technique and you get quite a few more viable cell density as a result of being able to nice low and slow add these nutrients to the cells as opposed to bolus feeding them and, and possibly shocking them in that way. And then, of course, we show you here all of the information on the metabolites and the analysis of what's going on inside the tank. Lactate accumulation goes up over time, which you would expect. Glucose consumption occurs over time, which you expect. And we have a nice uh, uh, metabolic profile with which to analyze these cells and to also provide data for scale-up. So we're able to get nice expansion of these cells in the DOS box in the 0 0.3 uh, liter scale. Are we still able to get these cells to uh, express pluripotency markers? And the answer to that question is yes. Again, uh, this data here is a mix of data from the two labs, from, from uh, our collaborator and from our lab here in Connecticut. So the uh, panels that I'm showing you on the top of the slide here, you can see phase contrast right here, which just shows the morphology of the cells and suspension. Um, cells here in this panel are expressing the multipotency marker TRA160, and then also the pluripotency marker SSEA4. And of course, we're using markers that are not included in the reprogramming cassette or Yamanaka factors so that we can, we can be sure that the they are genomic expression and not induced expression. And then this can also be done not just by fluorescence microscopy, but also by flow cytometry. And what we're looking for here is greater than 80% at this stage. Over time, these markers go right back up into the high 90s, but right after the expansion, we get 84% of cells expressing uh, TRA160, and then over 90% expressing SSDA4. And you can see that in these flow cytometry graphs here. So even after being amplified in stirred tank bioreactor format, we do still see expression of the pluripotency markers. And again, that expression actually gets even higher over time and over a passage number in the bioreactor. So what have we talked about so far? So in conclusion, 
I can say definitely that HSC expansion, although it is technically demanding, is achievable in a scalable and robust way using the BioBlue single-use vessel product line. And in this work, we've adhered to the three critical parameters that I outlined for you at the beginning of the talk. We're able to achieve large cell numbers, even over 1 billion HMSCs, and upwards of four to five fold IPSC expansion was achieved. And we're able to show that HMSC and IPSC retain their pluripotency markers. And then third, differentiation ability. We've also shown that MSCs grown in the bioreactor do retain the ability to differentiate into multiple cell types. And in fact, I can tell you now that since this presentation was made, the HIPSC differentiation has been done and cells that were grown in, in the 0.3C can be differentiated into cardiomyocytes, and that uh, data is available for, in publications from our collaborators at Hanover Medical School. The BioBlue single-use vessel, in combination with the DOSBox mini bioreactor or one of the bench-scale bioreactor systems, is a powerful way to establish your process, and in fact, it's scalable. And that's probably one of the most important points, is that when you get your process to work at the 0.3 liter scale, you want to be able to make more. And the scalability of the BioBlue Vessel product line has been tried and true and provides you with that extra confidence when you're designing a process. That's all I have for you today. I hope the presentation was informative and that you uh, came up with lots of great questions for me. Excellent presentation, Dr. Willard. Thanks for bringing that information to us. Before we get started with all of your questions, here's a quick reminder about how to reach us today. Questions can be sent via the green Q&A button at the lower left of the presentation window. We'll get to as many as we can. And our first is, how do you recommend testing the quality of the IPS cells throughout the reprogramming and expansion steps? Great question. So the way we do that here in our lab in uh, the US is we have a flow cytometry assay, which allows us to look at expression of SSEA4, TRA160, and SSEA1. Um, and we, can, we have it standardized to the point where we can take a sample of the bioreactor almost every other day or every day if we want to and go through this cell surface marker assay and then look and see what percentage of the population is still expressing these markers. And that's a really great way to know whether they're starting to lose their, their multipotency and starting to differentiate or not. The other way, of course, is just by morphology. A lot of times you can tell the cells start to change shape and size, and if you have a, uh, one of these counting devices, sometimes you can see the, the population start to drift over time just based on looking at cell counts. Can you use these for organoid culture with matrigel in suspension? Uh, we haven't done that in-house uh, uh, here at Eppendorf, but there are a lot of people in the field developing that right now, and I, and I was just looking into some of the literature recently. So there's a lot of promising research, but nothing that uh, I can present data from here today. The next one has a couple parts. Let me know if I need to uh, remind. Uh, okay. How do you recover MST cells from the microcarriers? What was the recovery efficiency? And what reagents were used? OK. Um, that's, that's OK. All those, those, uh, those parts are related, so I think I can remember them all. Um, so when we did uh, add MSC culture and BioBlue 5C vessel, we recovered the cells just using a standard trypsin digestion and our cells were over 90% viable. We didn't have any issues with that. Um, we were very successful. It did take a little bit of troubleshooting, of course, as to how long to leave the cells in trypsin, um, but that was quite successful for us. I've heard of some other groups using other types of disassociation reagents in case the trypsin is too harsh for your particular cell line. As I mentioned before, your cell line has a lot to do with how you will treat it. So. People have tried things like triple. Um, people have tried uh, Accutase and some of these other more gentle disassociation methods for also removing the cells from the microcarrier. The next question references slide 32. What was the time duration scheduled for media removal and addition? I can see the spike is for once a day, but I think you mentioned that it is every two hours. OK, hold on one second. Let me go back to slide 32 so I can make sure I'm talking about what we're, what I hope we are. OK. 
Can we see Wait, slide 32 me, now? Tell me if you need to repeat the question. Okay, so here we are on slide 32. And oh yes, I see I see your point. Um, so this slide was actually from, uh, let me see, the perfusion information is in the black line on this slide on the glucose profile. And it's actually being compared to the batch profile in red. So that's why the batch profile looks like it goes up and down in glucose here, in, this, in the red here. That's actually the batch data. And you can see the black line under it that just kind of like goes down slowly over time, that's the perfusion data. You're right, it was, uh, the media was removed every two hours um, for 10 minute settle time and then a seven milliliter uh, replenishment. So you can find all the detail for that in the publication that we're referencing here on this slide. Um, it's a very nice materials and methods section. They're great about saying exactly how they did it. So feel free to reference that. In the shaker versus spinner eval, was that the evaluation? What was the size of the spinner flask and agitation rate used? Of the spinner flask that we compared to. Oh my goodness. You got me. That's a detail that I haven't uh, thought about in, in a while, and you might have me on that one. I, I'll have to get back to them on that. <laughs> if they'd okay. like to send me an email, I'd be happy to send that information, or they can go ahead and um, I don't know if you noticed, but right on the actual slide was a reference to the paper that it came from here. Is that, is that up now? You can see in the bioprocessing journal there was a, is a cover article which was basically the establishment of this method. And we're happy to send you that reference where it shows all of our materials and methods on that. Sorry, I can't remember the RPM off the top of my head. Did you observe aspiration of microcarriers when doing a fed batch media change in the 5C fed centigrade BioBlue system, and how can this be prevented? Good question. So we did not uh, see much aspiration. There, of course, will be a few microcarriers that get sucked up. That's kind of like how uh, the, the method is, but it was very minimal in this experiment. We allowed the microcarrier to settle down in the vessel for about 20 minutes or so, and then we very slowly pumped off 50% of the vessel volume and then slowly added it back in. So there was not as much of an issue with microcarrier loss because the sample tube that we're using to remove my, the media was far enough away from the layer of microcarrier at the bottom of the vessel that we didn't lose very many. What do you mean by the um, IPSC's increase by fourfold? Is it fourfold increase per mil of media used? It's fourfold over inoculation volume. Or inoculation density, sorry. That was my fault. Okay, great. And pause, okay. Uh, next one is, what was the cell retention device used for perfusion? So. Um, as I, as I'm, let me see if I can call that slide back up again, and I'll tell you a little bit about how they did it. Um, back at slide 32 here. So what they did is they have a 0.3C, which is the cell culture version of our single-use vessel, and they stop agitation every two hours and then allow the, 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 micro or the aggregates to settle to the bottom. Then they just use a dip tube that's not all the way down to the bottom of the vessel, remove part of the media, and then replace it. So that, that's how that was done. And it can be automated very nicely in the software as well. So they didn't have to be there at the bioreactor every two hours. They didn't need a retention device either because since the aggregator, aggregate Sorry, <laughs> the aggregates are heavy enough, they settle down to the bottom just like a microcarrier would. So the aggregates themselves slide down to the bottom by gravity, you re remove the media, replace it, it's quite easy. Great. Uh, how did you get the cells off the microcarriers? Uh, so that was one that we, uh, we, at, we answered a little bit before, but I can uh, tell you again. The, our method was by trypsin disassociation, um, but other people have used other types of disaggregation methods in the past, um, more gentle reagents as well. 
Why do you use different sources of microcarriers in the different experiments? Well, that's a good question. So, um, as I've said quite a few times, I'm sorry if I'm a, a broken record at this point, but um, every single cell line has their own personality and their own uh, optimization that's required. And so what we found in our hands for the uh, adipose-derived mesenchymal stem cells was that we did not get very high expansion unless we went into uh, a collagen-coated microcarrier. So we tried a few different manufacturers and we got the best uh, amplification of those cells using the collagen-coated Paul microcarriers. Our group um, in Belgium got better amplification of cells using microcarrier from another source, and uh, GE, in fact, the Cytodex uh, product line. So it all depends on the cell line, and it all depends on which cell, which microcarrier surface your cells prefer. I'd like to thank the attendees for those great questions. If we didn't get to yours, we will follow up with you via email. And also, please note, the slides will be available for download. Uh, I would also like to once again thank Dr. Stacy Willard for her presentation. Do you have any final comments? I would just like to thank everybody for tuning in and for everybody who's going to listen to the recording after. I hope we've provided some confidence in the BioBlue product line for stem cell expansion, and we're happy to uh, talk to you about it further. Thank you. We'd also like to thank our sponsor, Eppendorf, for making it possible to bring this presentation to you. This webinar has been approved for continuing educational credits. Please click on the CE button at the bottom left corner and follow the process to receive your credits. Today's webcast will be available for on-demand viewing through June 6, 2017. You'll receive an email from us alerting you when it's available on demand and posted on labroots.com. You're welcome to forward this announcement to any colleagues who weren't able to join in today. Thanks for logging on and participating in today's broadcast. See you next time.